authority of the Ten Commandments, and what does that really mean? In application, we're going to be going through the Gospels with each commandment and into the Christian Didache, into the New Testament. What does this mean for us who live by the Gospel, who live by the teachings of Jesus Christ? And, and then someone might ask, ask the question, well, why do we begin in the Old Testament just to get all the way back to the New Testament anyway? Well, yeah, I mean, why don't we just start there and forget about the Old Testament? One answer, depth perception. Depth perception. Why was it that J.I. Packer, in his book, A Quest for Godliness, said that American evangelicalism is 3,000 miles wide and half an inch deep? There's no depth. We're lacking depth perception. Now, if you would cover up your left eye, you'd still be able to see. You take your Bible out, you cover up your left eye, you can't see what? The Old, old, the old Testament. I see a lot of people out there checking to see if that's true. It's true. You can still see. But you know what? You lack depth perception. Now, I know that personally because I don't see out of my left eye. I grew up and I could only see out of my right eye. Now, now it does have vision. It's out there somewhere. Okay. When I look at you in this congregation, I see you all out of my right eye. Now, they tell you that if you can only see out of one eye, that your mind can't properly triangulate distances and have depth perception. In other words, I can't tell the difference between whether John's closer to me or Craig, supposedly. And that's okay. You know, I mean, it doesn't cause a lot of problems in life unless you drive a car. Um, you're supposed to have trouble running into the back of people. Now, I haven't run into the back of too many people, and so it really d doesn't matter. And I, I imagine what happens is your mind eventually be able to to, to figure out how far someone is away from you on the basis of their size or something like that. I don't know exactly how it works. I can't hit a baseball. I know that. I can hit a softball. It's coming slow enough. Can't hit a baseball. What do I lack? Depth perception. Now, that doesn't matter much in life if you don't have depth perception. You're going to make it through. But when it comes to the scriptures, if you don't have depth perception, it means absolutely everything. Your understanding of the gospel is going to be extremely shallow. And you won't be able to recognize throughout the scriptures the continuing contrast between the law of God and the wonderful gospel of Jesus Christ. It is in the Old Testament that we gain a greater knowledge and a deeper knowledge of the character of God and a greater abhorrence of sin. And the picture of who God is and the wonderful thing that he does in the gospel becomes so much greater when we understand who God is. I see very few Americans abhorred with their sin. Matter of fact, we seem to be rather content about how special we are in the midst of life. It was Job, I believe, at the end of his experience. I believe it was Job chapter 31. Anyway, Job was a, a man that really didn't understand everything about God. His friends were worse, but Job didn't understand. Remember, he demanded that God come down and give an account of why Job was going through all that he was doing. Well, God did. So the Bible says God showed up in a whirlwind, and God spoke to Job out of the whirlwind. And he spoke for, in the Bible, several different chapters of which he described himself and the things that he had done and made. And what was Job's response? His response was pretty much like this. You know, I thought I was pretty good until I saw you with my own eyes. Now I abhor myself. I abhor myself. Guess what? He never even saw God. All he did was hear God describe who he was. See, that's what we get in the law of God. That's what we get in understanding the Old Testament. We learn who God really is. We get a clear picture of God so that we get a better picture of who we are in relationship to God and how great the gospel of Jesus Christ really is. Mother found her little boy sitting at a table and he was drawing and writing away and scribbling. He'd just come home from church. He said, honey, what are you doing? He says, I'm drawing a picture. She said, well, what are you drawing a picture of? He said, I'm drawing a picture of God. She said, honey, nobody knows what God looks like. He said, well, now they will. You know, that might be cute in the mind of a little child, how they perceive and think about God. 
But when it comes down to adults, don't we do the same thing? Don't we all have a picture in our minds of what God looks like and how we develop that picture usually has something to do with the way we were raised, how we look at life. How often does that picture determined by what God says about himself throughout the scriptures? The law, God's law, gives us an accurate picture of God's character and in his promises an accurate picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Last week I began giving you guidelines, one of four I gave you last week for understanding the Old Testament law. We talked about last week how the Old Testament law is a covenant. And this week we're going to begin, we want to talk about how the Old Covenant is not ours and is passed away. See, if we're going to get into studying the Ten Commandments, we need to understand the context. And we're going to bring this in right through the whole of the scriptures so that you understand each commandment and how it relates to the adorning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The old covenant is not ours and has passed away. Now take your Bibles and go with me now to Hebrews chapter 8, verse 13. We're going to be going around to a lot of different scripture because I want you to have a clear understanding of how the law fits in to the Christian life today. Hebrews 8, 13. 8, 13. This is right after he talks about the prophecy uh, of how God is going to work in the lives of Christians and uh, how their hearts are going to be changed. And we're going to have a new heart and a, and a heart that is, is moldable by the, the Holy Spirit. And he says in verse 13 of Hebrews chapter 8, the last verse, by calling this covenant new, that's the new covenant uh, that he describes in verse 10, he has made the first one obsolete. Okay, so the first covenant, the old covenant, not the covenant that was given to Abraham, okay, the covenant that was given to Moses and the Israelites has been made obsolete. And what is obsolete and aging will soon disappear. Now understand the phraseology there. He didn't say, because it's obsolete, it's gone, did he? He says, it will soon disappear. So what was happening there is that the, as the gospel was gaining an understanding and moving throughout the Roman Empire, the old covenant was dying. The old covenant was dying. If you're really clear about reading the book of Acts, you'll see that it is as much about the death of the old covenant as it is about the life that is presented in the new covenant. So it's passing away. Now, when did it pass away? It's a good question. I'm glad you asked it. It passed away, I believe, in 70 AD, when the fulfillment of the judgment on Jerusalem happened when Titus, a Roman general, completely flattened the city, destroyed the temple, destroyed the city completely. And I believe it was at that time that God ended Judaism as the law system that is now completely replaced with the gospel. Now, we can explain that in relationship to the life of the Apostle Paul. Because as you look through the book of Acts and the, the, a lot of the Israelites that are getting saved, they continue to follow the law. The Jewish believers don't all of a sudden say, hey, now I'm free. Now I can do whatever I want in life. I can live like the Gentiles. You see that they still had an understanding that the law was still in effect to some degree, and they were needed to live by those ceremonials and rules, ceremonies and rules. Go to, with me to Acts chapter 21. Acts chapter 21, because Paul, as he knows that he's on his way to Rome, goes back to Jerusalem. That's pretty much where he gets in trouble uh, between there and Rome, and he gets sent to Rome. Okay, so he goes back to Jerusalem. And he goes to Jerusalem and goes to all the leadership in Jerusalem to talk about all his, his journeys and what God's been doing in the midst of them. And if you go to, to chapter 21, verse 17, he says this. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Remember James, the brother of the Lord? He was the head of the church the respected head of the church there in Jerusalem. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard this, they praised God. And they said to Paul, You see, brothers, 
Brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed? And all of them are zealous for the law. Now, what would you expect Paul to say at this point if, in fact, the law had completely faded away? Paul, Paul would have said, hey, you got something mixed up here. We're preaching the gospel of the grace of God. The law no longer is in effect. That's what you would expect, unless Paul's a hypocrite. And some people have concluded that Paul was a hypocrite here in this passage of Scripture. I don't believe so. Verse 21, they have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come, so do what we tell you. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everyone will know there is no truth in these reports about you. That, but that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. And as for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. So Paul went ahead and did that. And what was he proving by that? It says it in verse 24, that you yourself are living in obedience to the law. And so the law was fading away. And until A.D. 70, the law still held power in relationship to the life of those that were Jews. And so while God expects of the Gentiles many of the same uh, Holy Spirit-inspired virtues and practices, the law or the whole law as a covenant does not belong to us but belong to them until 70 A.D. Okay, settled, I hope. Is there anything in the Old Covenant that remains? Is there anything that is in the Old Covenant but goes beyond that covenant and then applies to us as Christians today? And to understand that, we're going to divide the law into three parts. So we get an understanding of the law. First, there was the national law related to the civil order of the nation of Israel. And there the law was, cons was considered a legal curb to sin. The commands that govern Israel as a legal nation were given as a curb to sin, and then secondly, a hedge of protection against their enemies. A legal curb. Now, we know what a curb is, right? A curb is between a sidewalk where there are pedestrians and the road where there are cars. If you're driving a car, you're supposed to stay on the road. If you're walking, you're supposed to stay on the sidewalk. So it divides and protects the different realms. That's what the law was, a legal curb. Now, when I was in high school, I took driver's ed. And in taking driver's ed, they do it pretty much like they do today, I think, is you had to get in a car with several different people, and they would take turns driving. Well, I had been driving for years, so when I drove, the, uh, the driver instructor just read, yeah, I was driving out in the fields with that old Mustang. But I, I would, I, I, he'd just fall asleep. He'd read a book and he'd fall asleep and I'd just drive around the town. But we had a girl and she was scared to death. And the first day she told the, she told the, the driver's instructor, she says, I can't drive. I can't do this. I don't have any idea what I'm doing. She says, I'm going to end up going over the curb. Well, you know what that means. You turn a little sharp and you go over the curb or something. Well, she went over the curb all right, not with her back wheels, with her front wheels. And everybody was diving off the sidewalk. See, she had no idea where the curb was. But see, that's what the law of God in the Old Covenant was. As a national law, it was a legal curb to, to govern is the sin of the Israelites and then to protect them from the influence of the outside nations. God promised them that they would, as a nation, if they would yield and obey his law, they would be blessed as a nation. Let me give you an example of uh, national law, a legal curve. Go with me to Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy chapter 25. I'm going to give you a pretty easy one here. I mean, some of them get pretty wild, but this is pretty easy. Deuteronomy chapter 25, I'm going to read verses 1 to 3. When men have a dispute, they are to take it to court, 
and the judges will decide the case, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty. If the guilty man deserves to be beaten, the judge shall make him lie down and have him flogged in his presence with the number of lashes his crime deserves. But he must not give him more than 40 lashes. If he is flogged more than that, your brother will be degraded in your eyes. The law was very, very specific. And the punishment was quick, and it took place right in front of the court. Notice how specific. 39 lashes, beautiful. 40 lashes, too much. So the law is very clear in saying justice must be maintained very specifically. And that's the way the law worked as an example of national law. But today, you know, why doesn't it belong to us? Why, doesn't, why don't we have to obey this? Well, because Israel has ceased to be an entity of the blessing of God or the blessing before God as a nation. Now, I know that some people today don't teach that, but that is clearly what has happened in terms of Israel until the restoration of all things. Go with me to Romans chapter 11. Jump ahead to the New Testament. See, we're getting some depth perception here. Romans chapter 11, verse 25. I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery, brothers, so that you may not be conceited. Israel has experienced the hardening in part until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. And so what happens here is because Israel did not obey as a legal nation and entity before God, God has set them aside and turned his direction toward the progress of the gospel in the midst of the Gentile nations. And so at this point in history, at this point in time, Israel is set aside and actually is experiencing the curses of God. A lot of people today, and this is where I differ from some, Christianity is probably split uh, split right down the middle, believe that the the country of Israel, as it exists today, started some uh, 50 years ago or so, uh, 60 years ago or so, as it exists today, that it is the country that is the object of God's calling, the object of his blessing, the object of his delight. I do not believe that is true. I believe that Zionism is atheistic and relies on the strength and the power of man, not the strength and the power of God. I've got a friend who so believes that that little country today is the object of God's blessing that if, in fact, Israel and and America will get in 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 a war, that he would go over and fight for Israel against America. He believed it so strongly. But the Bible says we're not to bless what God has cursed. And if you know the scriptures, you know that right now, Israel is under the cursing of God until the latter days. Now, some people are saying, we're in those latter days, you can work that out yourself. But the idea that Israel as a theocracy is something that is to now being blessed by God and then we're to imitate, follow, and support, I don't believe is in the scripture and doesn't fit the time schedule. The national and the civil laws as applying to us are good but they have to be maintained in the midst of a theocracy. You know, there's a lot we can get in terms of the governance of our country out of, out of them, but we don't live in a theocracy, and America isn't governed under God like it should be. So they're not for us today. The national and civil laws are not for us today. We as Christians do not have to yield to them. They were for the nation of Israel in the Old Covenant. Number two, the ceremonial laws. What about them? Do we have to obey them? The sacrificing of animals and and all the things that surrounded the the worship of the temple. These are the commands that ordered the religious life or what is called the cultic life and practical worship of the Israelites. The ceremonial laws, just like the national laws were a legal picture, the ceremonial laws, laws are a pedagogical pedagogical, can I say it right, pedagogical picture. They were pointing to something greater in the future. A teaching, pedagogical means teaching, a teaching picture, pointing to something greater. Now, I don't know about you, but every once in a while, I got to put something together. And I loved having my son at home because he would do it for me. But I, I, I put stuff together once in a while, but I hate reading the directions. It's just a waste of time. 
it's nice when they got big pictures. You can look at the pictures, right, and see what you're supposed to do. That's what I do. You look at the pictures and you put something together. If you look at the pictures, then you understand what the final product's all about, right? And so the ceremonial law in all of the worship in the Old Testament, the sacrificing of animals and all of the festivals and all the different things that they were commanded to do on a regular basis were giving us a picture of the final product. What was the final product? It's the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. From the beginning of the scriptures to the end, it's said about eight different times in the scriptures that God wants to be our God, and we are to be his people, and he's going to walk in and amongst us as his people. In the old covenant, God dwelled in the temple. That was where his special presence was. That was the picture. And then the temple, as we go into the life of Jesus, Jesus becomes that special place, that special temple where God dwells. And then after the death of Christ, the new covenant is ratified by his death. Where is the temple now? Two places. We're the temple of the living God. That's what the Bible says. We're the place that God specially resides. And then secondly, the church is called the temple, the living temple, the place that God resides in his fullness where he will walk with us and we will walk with him. So the Old Testament covenant presented us a picture of what was to come. Think about the Day of Atonement, what they call Yom Kippur today. In Leviticus 16, it describes how once a year that the, the uh, high priest is to go in and to sacrifice animal, an animal, a spotless animal, for the sake of the gospel. I won't get into it all because we don't have time this morning. But he would show up and he would come out of that sacrifice. He would have blood over his hands. He would lay them on a goat and he would send that goat into the wilderness to show how their sins were removed by that sacrifice. What is that a picture of? It's a picture of Jesus Christ as he dies for our sin. And so when it comes to the reality of the redemptive work of Christ, we don't go back to the picture. No, no use to. The reality is here. When I put something together, I don't go back to the picture and say, I'm glad I have this picture. If I put a little kid's bike together, I go and say, I like, I like this little kid's bike. It's the reality. The picture just showed me how to put it together. Do you get that? That's what the ceremonial law is. The ceremonial law is no longer in effect today. Go with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8. Verses 1 to 2. The point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Now look down at verses 5 to 6. They serve at a sanctuary, talking about the priests, they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. That is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle, see to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown on the mountain. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, and it is founded on better promises. You know, if I, if I were to go to one of my grandkids and say, guess what? I have a picture, and I've got that which the picture represents. Which one do you want? How many of them are going to take the picture? They're going to take the toy. See, that's the way it is with the ceremonial law. Now that we have Christ, we don't need the ceremonial law. And R.J. Rushduni is wrong when he said that if he had his way in the churches, we would sacrifice animals as a type of Christ. We don't need that. The ceremonial law is no longer in effect today. So as we interpret the Old Testament law and get our depth in understanding the gospel, we are not going to say that you have to sacrifice animals and go through the ceremonial law. Lastly, there's the moral laws, what we would call the ethical commands. The moral laws, the ethical commands. 
And these are a guiding mirror, a guiding mirror for our life today. And these are the uh, relationship laws that govern the daily activity of life uh, in relationship to God and our neighbors. Now, Jesus reaffirmed uh, the validity of the Ten Commandments as a summary of the moral law in Matthew chapter 22. Go with me there, please. In other words, now we are taking something that existed in the Old Covenant and in the law and saying that it possesses authority and it possesses a powerful usage as Christians and in the Christian life today. Matthew chapter 22. When I get there, I'll tell you how much I'm going to read. Matthew chapter 22. As Jesus was being challenged about the law and different teachings in the law, I think we will read at verse 34, Matthew 22, verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and prophets hang on these two commandments. Now there's an issue here. If we're going to say the moral law is contained in the Ten Commandments, then why would Jesus point to two other commandments? Because those two commandments are, in fact, a summary of the Ten Commandments. What's called the first tablet of the law. You saw the picture earlier. I always picture it as having the two stone tablets. What it was called and determined uh, as the first tablet of the law contains the way that we are to look and respond to God. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that, that is listed right after the Ten Commandments in Deuteronomy chapter 5. But then he says, and to love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second tablet of the law. The next five or six commands, depending on whether or not you follow the Lutheran or the Reformed division of the commands, talks about how we treat our neighbors. Now that isn't contained there in Deuteronomy, but that verse comes out of, I believe, Leviticus chapter 19 on how we're to relate to our neighbors. But those two verses are a summary of the moral law as contained in the Ten Commandments. So if you picture this, they in fact are what the whole Ten Commandments hang on. They are a summary of the Ten Commandments. Anytime the Bible says there is a summary, do not ignore the things that add up to the sum. That doesn't make sense. In other words, if you take math class, it's one thing I was good at. I, I was terrible at a lot of things, but I could do math. But I realized that when I was, had to add up numbers and come up to a conclusion, that the cl conclusion, while it had validity, was only in, important as it related to bringing the numbers together. And so if you understand the numbers and how the numbers fit together, you understand the conclusion. This is what we mean by depth perception. You understand that the conclusion or the sum is that you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, and if you look back at the Ten Commandments, you're going to understand what that means and how to get perception into the lifestyle that goes along with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So the sum of the law applies. How do we know which sum applies to us today? Point C, our third point, part of the Old Covenant is specifically amplified, clarified, and applied in the New Testament, in the New Covenant. In the Gospels, the Ten Commandments are reaffirmed and they're deepened in heart and tent. And this will give you an example. Go with me to Matthew chapter 5. This will give you an example of how we will teach um, the, the commandments as we go throughout the Scriptures. Matthew chapter 5, look at verse 27. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Well, that's one of the Ten Commandments. But I tell you, now Jesus is going to change some things. He's going to amplify it, and he's going to take it from the stone tablet to the heart of gospel life. That's what he's going to do. He's going to drive it deeper in your understanding. 
Do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So we may proudly say, you know what? I got a happy marriage. I love my wife. I never committed adultery. Well, yes, you have, and you need to learn to abhor yourself because you've just got an image of what God is like, and you've seen his reflection in a mirror, and you know what you look like. You need to understand that you are, in fact, an adulterer and flee to Christ and the promise of forgiveness in the gospel and the promise of power and transformation. If the, in the epistles, that which reappears, not, not just the epistles, but in the gospels and in the epistles, that which reappears from the old covenant specifically applied, is valid for us today. Now, interesting enough, there's two systems of thought. Pretty much Christianity is divided, uh, evangelical Christianity is divided right down the center between Reformed and dispensational Christianity. Reformed Christianity, which has a tendency to focus more on the law of God, says it this way. If the law is not specifically abrogated, if it is not specifically condemned or saying it's no longer in effect in the Old Covenant, then we have to follow it today. So anything that isn't talked about and said, hey, we don't have to do that anymore in the Old Testament still needs to be followed. Now, dispensational ideology says, no, only that which is specifically reaffirmed in the New Covenant is to be followed. I go with that way. In other words, if the Old Testament uses the Ten Commandments, reaffirms them, amplifies them, and applies them, then they are, in fact, to be applied and held as a standard of God's authoritative, uh, sovereign rule in the lives of Christians today. So in the Gospels, they're reaffirmed, they're deepened in heart and intent, in, heart and intent. in the epistles, they are clarified, they are expanded in application as the lifestyle that ordains the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the problems we have today is people believe that they can have a relationship with Jesus Christ, but then jettison the lifestyle that flows out of that relationship. One of the last letters that is written in the Bible, 1 John, John there says, if someone says that I know him and doesn't obey his commandments, he's a liar and the truth isn't in him. In other words, if we are not walking faithfully, in the teachings of Jesus Christ, as revealed in the epistles, the lifestyle of Christian, Christians that we're supposed to live day by day by day. If we're not doing that, there's something wrong with our relationship with God. We're commanded. They have authority over us as as Christians today. Go with me to Romans chapter 13. Let me show you that. Romans chapter 13, verse 9. Let me start in verse 8. Let no debt remaining, remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. Now listen to this. This is how he uses it. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. This is what we're talking about. The sum, fulfilling it. The commandments, and he goes through them. Do not commit adultery. This is the second tablet of the law in loving one another. Do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever else commandment, there, whatever, whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. So what does God do there? He shows us how we as Christians are in fact to love our neighbors, very specifically. I can't say I love my neighbor and covet what my neighbor has. I can't say I love my neighbor and steal from my neighbor. I cannot say I love my neighbor, says do not commit murder. What does that mean? And murder my neighbor. How can I murder my neighbor? Jesus took the command and said, if you say your neighbor's a fool, you murdered him. Right? So we get depth perception in understanding the lifestyle that we are to live as Christians today. The moral law, which is specifically amplified, clarified, and applied, is a mirror, a guiding mirror of godliness to show us our sin. 
a guiding mirror of godliness to show us our sin. Go to James. Book of James. Chapter 1, verse 22. Now understand that the book of James was written by the one we just ran into at the beginning of this sermon, the brother of Jesus, the head of the church of Jerusalem, who in Acts chapter 21 said that Paul needed to show everybody they wasn't in fact teaching Jews that they had to be obedient to the law. This is one of the earliest Christian writings. It is written in the context of Jewish Christianity. And, and you can't take the references to the law here and make them something different than the Jewish Old Covenant law. We'll see this, how, the, how this works as a mirror, though. James chapter 1, verse 22. Wrong page. There we go. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in the mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has, what, heard, but doing it, he will be blessed in what he does. Now understand at this point in church history, there was no New Testament written. No New Testament. He is talking specifically about looking into the Old Testament law that gives freedom. This is depth perception, by the way. Getting an image of ourselves by looking at God in the picture that's presented through the Old Covenant, through the teaching of the law. Let me show it to you again. Chapter 2. Let me verify that for you. Chapter 2, verse 8. He says, if you really love keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself. Remember where that came from? Leviticus chapter 19. You are doing right, but if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said do not commit adultery also said do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but do commit murder, you have become a law breaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Now understand what he's saying here. He is not saying that we are condemned by the law today. He has experienced the salvation that comes in Christ as Jesus being the only one who fulfilled perfectly the obedience that the law demanded did so on our behalf so that through faith we have the righteousness of Christ applied to our lives. James believed that, but he also believed that there was usage in the Ten Commandments, in the moral law, to show us a proper reflection of the righteousness of God so that we can look at ourselves and say, hey, look, we don't measure up. And that not measuring up is to bring it into us an abhorrence of our sin a deepening of the understanding of the character of God, and then a greater appreciation for the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it's a mirror of godliness. Maybe today I'll just finish uh, with this since we're running out of time. The last point, all the old covenant is still profitable for us today. Uh, Timothy, it's written in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. It says specifically that. And it is, helps us on our path to being godly Christians and understanding that. It's the only Bible that the early Christians actually had. And you'll see that as, as you read 2 Timothy 3, 14 uh, to 17. But let me give you some help. By just give, let me give you an illustration as we close today. Most American Christian, Christians, we think we're pretty good. We think we're pretty cool stuff. You know, we look at each other. That's how we judge, Right? I'm better than him. I'm better than her, right? We create in these pictures in our mind of what God really looks like. And for the most part, it's like the, the Greek, Greek mythology. God's a little bit better than us. We're just a little bit missing the mark. But missing the mark is missing the law, the righteousness of the law. Because sin is breaking the commandments. 1 John chapter 3. New Testament writing. 
If we properly have the right vision of God, we're going to have the right vision of ourselves and those around us. Let me illustrate it this way as we close. Suppose you took a group of five men. They grew up in a house all by themselves, never saw anyone on the outside, and they were terribly deformed. Their arms were twisted, their legs were twisted, their back was twisted, their faces were grotesque. But they never saw anybody else. You know what? They would think they're pretty cool stuff. Matter of fact, they'd be judging between each other, wouldn't they? You know, I'm not as twisted as you, right? They wouldn't even know they were twisted. I'm bigger, I'm better, whatever. We do it all the time. They would think they're pretty good stuff. They compare themselves with each other. But suppose someone sent them by mail a description of a perfect man. Tall, straight, muscular, could run like a deer and jump, and a perfect man. What would they do? They'd look at that letter, and they'd look at themselves, and they would understand how grotesque they were, how deficient they were, how much they needed strength. They needed power. They needed to be made whole. That is what the law of God does. It's the letter of God's perfect righteousness given to us whose sin has grotesquely deformed, who we need to, in the light of the law of God, humble ourselves and repent, having our hearts broken before God, knowing that Jesus Christ is our only solution. And allow him to work mightily in the rebuilding process as he shapes our lives and helps us understand what true righteousness is. It takes a whole Bible to make a whole Christian. If we don't want our Christianity to be 3,000 miles wide and half an inch deep, it's time we get some depth perception. It's time we get some understanding out of all of the scriptures. And we are going to do that in the Ten Commandments and go specifically commandment by commandment to help you understand what it means to walk and be and live the righteousness of God and Jesus Christ, his Son, as a demonstration of the beauty of the gospel. Let's pray this morning. Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the whole of Scripture. And I pray, Lord, today that as we go out from here, we will not forget to look in your mirror of righteousness, to see you as the God who is righteous and holy and perfect and just and loving and gracious and full of grace, full of mercy, loves us with an everlasting love, that we will not fail to study your word and come to understand who you are and then come to understand who we are in our need of the work of Jesus Christ, applied to our account that we may be considered, deemed, and have the righteousness of Christ forever and ever and ever. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your law. Help us as Christians to be abhorred with our sin and to seek after the image of Jesus Christ, the example of Jesus Christ, and the life of Jesus Christ as we live day by day in this world. In Jesus' name we pray.